You are listening to Down Home. In this episode, we talk to our mothers about their experiences as young black women in the 60s and 70s. We had a few audio issues in the first couple of minutes, so bear with us. Welcome to Down Home, the Nova Scotian experience from two black men. Uh, We have a very special episode this week uh, with our mothers. Reason that we're bringing our mothers on this week, uh, I, we really do believe that Black women have been the driving force in keeping families and neighborhoods together. And uh, we wanted to bring our mothers on to add their voices to our discussion. So we have uh, Heather Chandler, who is my mother. Give a wave, Mom. Mm-hmm. That's my mother. And we have Stacy Jones, who is uh, Jay Jones' mom, right there. And of course, we have Jay Jones. Hey, what's happening, people? (laughs) (laughs) So usually we ask our guests to do a little bit of bio, but our our first um, point of conversation actually will lead uh, our moms to give a little bit of back history anyway. So I think we'll just jump into it. So let's Um, do it. So we, 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 to begin, we really wanted uh, both of you to talk about your upbringing and essentially what it was like to be a young black woman in Halifax in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Mom, why don't you start off? Wow. Where do I start? Um, It's a loaded question. (laughs) It is. Well, you know, when I reflect on my childhood, I realize really how lucky I was. Lucky because we grew up in a real uh, family of of a whole neighborhood Um, in the middle of the city. Our life was family, extended family, church, church extensions around the province. So that was our life. And it was really well sheltered until we went to school. And so having that basis, we had a strong um, sense of identity, a sense of being, and we were always taught to have purpose. And so, and and when I say taught to have purpose, our parents um, really instilled in us that we had to develop a purpose, stay with it, um, and have dreams and go for those dreams. And so from that perspective, I always look at my child as uh, favorable. Moving into the, the 60s and 70s, 60s was a great time for me. Um, we had a very sheltered, we led a very sheltered life as children. Our parents really protected us, so... They didn't want us traveling too far from our neighborhood. And that's something that I, for the most part, ignored a little bit (laughs) as much as I could. And so it led me to places like Rocky Jones's Kawacha House, which I believe saved my life in the 60s. Um, Growing up to that point uh, and reaching teenage years, I always knew that um, there was a difference between my life and my white counterparts' lives. And I didn't really find a way to articulate that until we would go to meetings at Kawacha House, and these are the kinds of discussions we would have. Not only that, but, you know, Rocky Jones, I credit with teaching me a lot about Um, African Nova Scotian history and uh, the migration of um, people of African descent to Nova Scotia and talk about empowering. So that's where my activism started. And and I guess it was a little more than just inter-community development as well, because during the 60s and 70s, I was doing some theater. So that opened my horizons a little more beyond the community. And I met a lot of people who were 
uh, activists and interested in, in human rights um, that were not just people of color or people of African descent. So I learned uh, from those relationships as well about um, how to articulate what was going on around racism, um, how to ask for and get things that I needed. Um, education at that point, from my perspective, was not relevant at all. Mm -hmm. um, during the 60s and 70s, we had in Nova Scotia the dismantling of Africville. And during that time, it, it was, of course, very upsetting for everyone. I can't imagine what it was like to live through that and live in the community of Africville and seeing it destroyed um, right under your feet. Uh, but it certainly did start um, the whole notion of we have to do something about it. And so there were demonstrations and there were sit-ins. And I can remember distinctly that um, I called my mother one day from school. Um, they actually had pay phones at the school. And I called her and said that we have to go down to City Hall and sit in. And for anyone who remembers my mother, she was a very conservative, small C conservative <laughs> person. But she met me down there mm -hmm. um, and joined the protest. And so, you know, there was that protest. There was even back in that day, and I'm sure, Stacy, you remember some of this as well. There was rumor and... Um, incidents of police cruelty and so we demonstrated against that um, there were demonstrations against unfair hiring lack of job opportunities and so that's that's how i spent most of my high school years um, learning and reading and and understanding that that i had a part to play in in what was going on in the community Mm -hmm. yeah, wow, that's excellent. Well, and and Stacy, when you when you think back, uh, what what comes to mind in your uh, your experience as a young, as a young black woman in the sixties and seventies? In the sixties and the seventies, um, I was in Halifax for a little while growing up. Um, I moved to Toronto. Um, rather early on at the age, I think, of seven. Oh. But I do remember before that, though, going to church. We lived in Armdale, which was on the outskirts of Halifax at the time, past the Rotary and uh, in a white neighborhood. So I guess maybe looking back, the thing that stands out the most is that I grew up in a mostly white neighborhood, went to a white school, um, and then at the age of seven, moved to uh, Toronto, where I was with my mom and my dad, and we moved around quite a bit. But I don't know if I'm speaking to your point. These are just the things that I am remembering. Um, growing up until age seven, it was great. Lots of singing again, going to church. Um, but we were always in a taxi, going to the black part of town, and then coming back and living in the other side of town. So in terms of identity, I would say that my line was very uh, split down the middle because often I was the only black kid around. And that didn't really bother me though. I never looked at the color. Um, I just went to school and loved it, was in the school choirs and uh, did a lot of amazing things and when I moved to uh, Toronto though it was without my parents I went to live with Martin my stepfather I went to Sheldon and I went to live with them in Welland Ontario so that was another I guess more mixed part of uh, Ontario it was down home like in terms of the size the way we might look at Halifax or uh, or um, 
you know, any small boroughs in Halifax at the time. Um, and uh, did quite a bit of schooling, but there was a lot of moving around. And Jason and I, or rather Jason, forgive me, or somewhere in my mind, <laughs> uh, Sheldon and I were, we were moved around a lot. Um, but then uh, when I turned 10, Sheldon and I came back to um, Halifax again, and I was there until I was 26 years old. So a lot of my living did happen in Halifax further than that. High school was, was good, great fun. Um, I paused midway through because that's when I had uh, Jason. But I went back to school right after that, and I was a cheerleader, <laughs> big on basketball, um, not involved in the same things as, um, you know, Heather was involved in. But we do have the common thread of Rocky and Joan Jones. I spent a lot of time with them in... Uh, Toronto f through various uh, circumstances, which we might get through later, but I remember them as being two of the most amazing black people I had ever known. They uh, opened my eyes certainly to things that were going on in the world and uh, to music and how to cook food and just to uh, help me uh, open my eyes and observe a lot as a child. Fast forwarding a little bit further into your lives, um, there, there was a decision to actually leave down home uh, for both of you. Uh, me and Jay have talked about this uh, often about what went into our decisions to actually leave down home. Um, uh, Stacy, can you speak to when you're an older an adult, when you're an adult, what, into your, what went into your decision to actually leave Halifax? Um. A lot of things. I would say, um, first of all, there was always that line drawn. School and, you know, my other friends having fun. The church line, going to church, behaving, towing the line, being a good young Christian girl. Um, as I grew older, God forgive me, uh, as seeing what was happening in church, seeing what was happening in the world, um, I began to just see that, you know, I'll just say it, you know, hypocritical types of teachings happening, okay, um, which just make you open your eyes and question things more. So as that continued on, I was working, I was doing my best to take care of uh, myself and to take care of Jason. It was difficult. It was difficult. I was probably, you know, depressed through most of that time and not aware of it, at one point, I just uh, sort of took a break, took a year off from everything and everybody, and gave myself what I call the sleep cure. Every night I went to bed and I looked back at my life and I thought, who was involved? How did I get here? You know, I have a son, I'm a young girl, I'm just about 20, where am I going, what am I doing? Anyway, I took that year off. Uh, then it was time to get back into the world again. I was working. I was more independent. And then I decided that I wanted to get a home of my own and take Jason with me. Um, Heather, you said you were very protected. So I expect you understand when I say that our uh, protectors, in my case, my, my grandparents, um, had very strong opinions on what I could and could not do, even mm -hmm. though even though I was a, you know, a young woman of age and could make my own decisions. They wouldn't let me just step out of the, step out of the nest to try and take my son with me. Um, granddad, you know, God bless him. I love that man, except at that moment he had no faith that I could make it through those next steps. In truth, he was right in a way. I certainly didn't know what I was going to do, but... Um, that's when you try when when you're young um so as time went on i just got more and more frustrated i was uh had to be home at a certain time i had to knock on the door to get into the house when i was 22 and i just said no i'm going and i i i said i was taking jason and granddad then put his foot down and said you know what you're not taking that child with you. So I called my mother and I told her what was happening. 
and she sent me a train ticket. It was a matter of saving my life. You know, it was a matter of protecting Jason. I needed to expand and because I didn't get the support at home, I went further afield than I probably would have. I probably would have stayed in Halifax. But because I knew my mother was here and supported me, at least to get out the door, that was what I chose to do. Interesting. So it was more centered along uh, family. Your oh, decision. yes, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. And, and mom, like uh, looking back, you know, I lived it myself as well, but I want to get your take on uh, <laughs> I know, yeah. Yeah, what went into your decision to, uh, to leave down home. Well, you know, I'd like to tell you that I planned it, but I really didn't. <laughs> I, um, I was at the time we were, um, I was working at Dell, going to school full time. And I thought things were going along. Okay. It was hectic, but I, I really was having a good time at that time, um, in my life. And, um, I had a friend who was graduating from med school. And he was looking for places to go. He didn't want to stay in Halifax. He and, and his um, partner were both friends of mine. And so over dinner one night, we decided that we were all going to move. And I left that dinner that night and didn't think another thing about it. And uh, I got a call from, from this person and he said, it looks like there's a clinic in Brockville, Ontario. Do you want to go? And I said, sure, I'll go. <laughs> and that's how we ended up leaving Nova Scotia. Um, needless to say, the family thought I had lost my mind for sure. Um, but I thought, you know, what have we got to lose, really? I mean, it was on the Thousand Islands. It was well uh, um, within driving distance of Nova Scotia. And my, my outlook is always, how bad can it be? You know, there's always home. You can always go home if it gets bad. And so that's how we ended up uh, leaving Nova Scotia. I drove whatever I could in the car. And then I came back to get Derek. And we actually went up by train with the hamster. I don't know if you remember that part, Gary. <laughs> I do. I do. Anyway, we went up with the hamster and started a new life in Brockville, Ontario. Wow. And that's awesome. how we decided to move. That's good. That's, yeah. That's, uh, well, I mean, that's, that's brave, but that's also like my mom said, uh, that's what you do when you're young. You just sort of take a chance, you know? Yeah, you do. Yeah. Now, now, mom, um, what, when you moved in your 20s to come back to Ontario after leaving Nova Scotia, what did you find it was like being a black woman as you were now a young woman? And did you find, I wanted to ask you this, did you find in your upbringing, you created this sort of duality, being from an all-white neighborhood, um, to, to adapt to sort of um, that way of life, like just to sort of to slide under the radar while, you know, not necessarily being in touch with your black roots. But um, did you find, because I know I did growing up in Klein Heights, I kind of just adapted to, to sort of fit in there. And then, you know, we take a taxi to church every Sunday and, you know, and then I was sort of with sort of the black community. Did you find you had to um, do that to, as a way to survive? Absolutely. I am one of the queens of adaptation, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> I so did. But again, even though I just never let it be an issue. Uh, mm -hmm. There were taunts, but I never paid attention. I was, you know, president in junior high school, you know, in Halifax West High School. They let me be it. They let me. And I think back because in those days, in an all white school, they didn't have to let me do anything, you know, but I was 
I felt accepted. Nobody pushed me back or said, no, Stacy, you, you can't. But I know that with, I'd say I did more adapting within the black side of my family, actually, than on the white side of my family, if that makes any sense, you know? Yeah, um, yeah I was definitely always two people. Because right. there, there, there was always an underlying current, though, you know, for as much as I did. I'm sure that there was someone that would have something to say, but I didn't carry that cloak. People were people, and I was pretty popular in spite of and because of, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, but what was it like for you uh, in, in Ontario? As a in in Ontario, it was pretty much the same thing because mm -hmm. when I came here, I stayed with mom for a while. Then I had to get a job. I stayed with two friends, you know, two gay friends in the downtown ghetto of Toronto until I got at my own place to live. But I remember when I came to the job search, one day I was either going to be a waitress or I was going to be a secretary because I... I knew how to type. I'd gone to business school in Halifax. Um, I, was, I told the girl, the woman at the uh, agency, you know, I had a job as a waitress. So I was going to take that. And she goes, oh, well, if you want to, you know, be a waitress all your life and have people crap all over you, go ahead. But this is a proper job in an office building in downtown Toronto. Go and take it. So I did. That led me on to a whole lot of other things. Um, I know there always has been racism, but I don't know how much it has really stung me. Does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 of course. Of course. Okay. okay. So what 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 went in your decision to go back to Halifax as as a you know, when you were you were you were in Toronto from seven until ten? Until ten. Yeah. Um what made me go back to Halifax? Did I go back to Halifax? Seven till 10. I was in Halifax then until I was 26. Right. Then I came back to Toronto. Right. And after so, years in Toronto, then I moved to Newfoundland. I see. Okay. So yeah. there, No, that's good. So your decision to go to Newfoundland after, you, like, when you're, you're an adult, you're chilling in Toronto, you're, you've, you've made a life, right? Mm-hmm. Why go back to the Maritimes? Yeah. Um, I, uh, when I was working, the last job I had in uh, Toronto, in Hal Halifax, was at the Clipper Key restaurant. And Heather, I have to tell you, I worked at Dalhousie University for four years. So oh, you also have that in common. Isn't that yeah. funny? We'll talk about that another time. But anyway, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I was working at Clipper Key, and one of the women I met there, who was still a lifelong friend, uh, she was from Newfoundland, uh, an artist model, and uh, I uh, connected with her when uh, I was here in Toronto. We were all here at the same time. I went to Newfoundland to visit them on a, my birthday and a Christmas holiday, which is December 29th through to New Year's, and uh, I fell in love with the place. I really? never, I just fell in love with the place. Interesting. I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the country itself, the sea, uh, the culture, and it was a no bullshit place. Uh, big fish in a little pond. And I just started the next part of my journey as a grown up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to ask one question, mom. Um, as a black woman, you're, you're a little bit lighter uh, complexion. <laughs> <laughs> and did did you think that had an effect where you didn't really, you were able to navigate a lot easier and not f sort of feel the sting of racism? Because like for me, uh, it was, it was because I'm, I'm darker than you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got it a lot, like a lot of, uh, especially when I was a, a little child, but uh, did you find it easier to blend in because of that? Um, that could be the case. Again, I have to say that I didn't really feel that that was on me. I, I do remember a lot of comments growing up. Oh, isn't she pretty? Oh, look at her hair. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I guess I took it with a grain of salt. But again, 
I knew that I was black enough that people would still comment on it. You mm. know, at school, they'd put me in the middle of the white kids to sing in the choir for the Christmas show. But somebody took a look at that. And then when the show happened, you know, I was at the end. So sometimes people made those choices and it isn't now until I reflect back that I see what mm -hmm. those situations were, were, were or are. And I came across those in odd times throughout my life. But again, I never carried it or put it on other people. So uh, it just wasn't that much of an issue. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Oh, then, uh, and mom, what, what about you when, uh, like your, uh, your experiences in the, uh, the eighties in Ontario, uh, did you find there was a huge cultural difference between being, you know, growing up, growing up in the North and Halifax, predominantly black, uh, neighborhood, and then going to Ontario, uh, what mm -hmm. were the, what were the major differences that you saw? Well, I guess just, just to, walk it back a little bit. I was from an early age, as I think I said, cognizant of race. Moving to Ontario, it just meant a different flavor. That's all. Mm -hmm. And you recall that we, when we moved to Brockville, it was a really rather small town. And we were one of two racially visible families at the time. Mm -hmm. So because I worked in a, in a doctor's office and had some authority, people viewed me uh, a little differently than they would with, would have viewed a black woman without authority. Mm -hmm. People are most vulnerable when they're dealing with doctors and they all had to go through me and they all have to, so it's a different kind of feel. Um, and I've experienced um, racism in the same way uh, in Ontario as I did in Halifax. Um, as I said, it's just a different flavor. Mm -hmm. and, and I always recall that um, once, once being, once the experience of being a parent to a black child, uh, was was my everyday experience, um, then you don't get away from it. Mm -hmm. You know, I was constantly telling people that um, it was okay for my son to draw and color in brown people. Teachers always had an issue with that. You know, we're trying to teach him not to see himself as different. I said, well, he is different, and that's <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah, you know, we're both different, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So I had to do that in Ontario, as well as Halifax. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had a ready-made job in Ontario, so I didn't have to look. But I dare say that you know my lived experience taught me that perhaps it wouldn't have been so easy for me to walk into a job especially at the level where I was. Mm -hmm. So what brought me back to Halifax was when um, daddy got very ill and I actually took a leave of absence to come back. And again, this is serendipity. Um, my partner at the time, um, we were he was living and working in Toronto and got an opportunity to live and work in Florida. So I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to move to the States, but I'm going to move back to Halifax ultimately to go back to Dalhousie and finish my degree. And so that's what brought me back family concerns um, and getting back to university. Um, but I also felt like being here, there was work for me to, done in to do in terms of social context education, in terms of 
um, working on racially or racial justice issues. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. And I started um, a lot of reading because there weren't courses at that time that you could take. Um, I graduated university and ultimately started working on another uh, discipline, which is human resources. And then I started uh, providing social context education. So teaching people how to identify systemic issues, whether it's racism or sexism or homophobia, homophobia rather. Uh, in education and health and in community living. And so I've sort of always been in the vortex of looking at race on a minute by minute basis. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I both enjoyed and something that's caused me a great deal of angst over the years. Yeah. Um, just because I'm having a conversation with you, Jason, and Derek that my mother might have had with me and did have with me mm -hmm. around issues of racism in our community. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, while there have been improvements, my job was always to get people in organizations to look at systemic practices and how that is where the difference is going to be made. Yeah. Um, you know, it's okay. I call it diversity tourism. When you go and buy knickknacks or you, you know, you have um, potlucks and that kind of thing. There's nothing yeah. wrong with potlucks. Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. No. <laughs> but, you know, the state of affairs is that we need to look a little more deep and below the surface than that. So I don't know if I've answered your question or not, but I think that I've never gotten away from the issues of systemic discrimination. And of course, then there's the intersection of being female, being black. Yes. And at one point being a single parent. Yeah. So, you know, it's like a yeah. salad of, yeah, this is how you have torture in your life. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd like to add something in, if I may, in terms of, course. Of, of what Heather was saying, in terms of the community work that you did, in terms of racism towards me, preconceptions that people have about people of a certain color, the color of my skin. As I uh -huh. look back and reflect, I there were many, many times in my life where I had been, um, you know, followed by crazy men in cars, um, propositions made to me, you know, out of car windows as I'm simply walking to work. Mm. Um, even young girls, I remember, on uh, Isabella Street where I lived, they would warn me that the cops were coming out. So I think for me, if there was any issue, it wasn't uh, a racism as much because I looked the way that I did with a full figure, a young face and all the rest of it, there was, uh, I would say that that type of racism or I guess we can call it sexism. I don't yes, know of course. proper terms. That is something that I can say has uh, followed me throughout my life, no matter where I was, both in Halifax, in uh, Toronto and in Newfoundland. And, you know, even now, occasionally, you still get that same odd thing happening. So I just wanted to, it came to mind as you were speaking, Heather, so mm -hmm. I thought I should add that in, in terms of another way we're looked at, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. It, um, you know, they're not only that, um, just on a side note, I know we, we haven't talked about this, but the, um, the portrayal of Black women in, in, in media, Mm -hmm. um, and and how you know erroneous it is like yes. and, but the the thing is though uh, uh being a black woman and and um and seeing these betrayals of how black women are are 
in movies and, and even in the news sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, what are your thoughts and feelings about that? Mom, go ahead. Well, from my perspective, I have always um, seen that there is um, a portrayal of people that look like me that I didn't care for. Mm -hmm. Um, And this, to my mind, is so important why conversations like this are so valuable to bring to light that there is a portrayal of of any given ethnicity or group of people that may not exactly be accurate. And so, um, you know, even today, sometimes it's not as blatant as it used to be, mind you, but it's still there. And that's why critical thought and critical education is so important Mm -hmm. because I don't believe that those things change without it. How does it slip by? How many people in boardrooms see it, but don't see an issue? Mm -hmm. And so that's why conversations like this and education around um, critical examination is so very important. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, and it really starts in, in, in the area that you sort of started to focus on when you came out of school, you know. Um, like you mentioned, it was, uh, we, uh, Derek and I have had these uh, conversations many times uh, uh, just about where the systemic race, racism does exist in, you know, sort of like in law and in police uh-huh. and, and uh-huh. everything like that. Like uh-huh. those are the things that are so ingrained that are really – stopping us from sort of evolving just as human beings you know yeah Um, Yeah. so i i totally agree the conversation has to be had there the education uh is definitely important you know absolutely and it goes beyond being nice to your fellow human being of course yes it goes to examination of policies practices and procedures Mm -hmm. and that's hard work that mm-hmm. is heavy lifting. Yeah. Any organization that commits to a review of that kind is really committed to change. Mm-hmm. And it's where you actually pull apart every written policy, every policy that's not written as well, because a lot of organizations have practices that aren't actually written in policy, but people do it. Yes. You know, for example, asking so-and-so if they know somebody who'd like to work at this job. Well, that's not how you build equity in an organization. Yeah. Because usually that person is a white, able-bodied male. Usually. Yeah. Yeah. Not always, but usually. So Mm -hmm. chances are that the person they're going to refer chances are that that person will then be a white, able-bodied Christian male. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that's a, that's a pretty standard observation. Um, but that's usually how it goes. And, and all you have to do to prove that theory is look at uh, what organizations look like at top management. Um you know, it just requires a little bit of critical thought. Yeah, Why is it that everyone who's in a position of authority looks the same? Yeah. From an ethnic perspective, from a gender perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where uh, the questions need to be asked and the conversations need to be had. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's not a... Um... And it's not a natural thing for a lot of people to question, you know. Um, that's right. And that's why work has to be put into it, I think. And um, we've, we, me and Jay have had this discussion before where, you know, the, it's good to have this discussion about systemic racism because when you're thinking about it, there aren't a lot of overt racist things that happen day to day in our lives. The, this, because we surround ourselves with like people. Yeah. So, you know, to, to point out 
you know, maybe that interaction with that particular person wasn't great. You know, you have to sit back and think about it and say, ah, maybe it wasn't. Yeah, but, it happens after you walk away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It yeah, sure that's, does. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Um, well, that this has been great. Uh, Jay Jones, you want to take us out? Yes. I mean, I mean, this is true. Truly, uh, the thing I love about what Derek and I are doing is it, it allowed us to sort of bring some of our the people we know uh, together to talk about the experiences. And, you know, during this past summer, a lot of things have happened, and it's triggered things in me and in Derek, and we started to have this discussion. And we wanted to sort of celebrate um, the resilience of people who were from Nova Scotia. So we have some people lined up in the upcoming episodes and it has just sort of brought um, us together to share the experiences um, of, of our upbringing. And I mean, of course, it's a huge, huge honor to have our mothers um, who Derek and I have been friends for so, so long. And it's, it's cool. I know you guys know of each other, but I really loved how um, your worlds were really connected. I mean, Halifax is a small city, but the fact, <laughs> Heather, the, the fact Heather, that you sort of uh, got some mentorship and guidance from our relative Rocky Jones, um, it, it, it's empowering to know that um, uh, where we come from and the power that you two as women uh, in the circumstances that you had um, gave us, you know, your best you're the best environment that we could have. And, and I'm glad Derek and I have been able to uh, carry, carry it on together as friends. Um, so I just want to say uh, both of you are both amazing women and uh, inspiring and empowering. And I'm, I'm, mom, I'm glad to call you mom. And, and Heather, you were always kind of my second mom growing up as well <laughs> when Derek and I became friends. So I want to thank you. And uh, what thank we you. Had, our, our first episode was called This Is Us. And uh, this episode is called This Is Them. And for everyone out there listening, there is no us without them. So these are our mothers, Heather Chandler and Stacey Jones. And thanks for your insight and sharing a little bit of your story. This has been another episode of Down Home. And we look forward to bringing you more content in the future and sharing uh, this experience to keep conversations alive. Word. <laughs> breaking new crown, breaking new crown, breaking new crown, sip a breaking new crown, breaking new You have been listening to Down Home. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. The song Breaking New Ground from The Breakdown. On a high plateau, from the one down below to the future of the funk getting lost in.